Excellent. Welcome to the MessWide Framework Demo for 129-2019, the second demo of the year. Uh, we got a lot of really cool new features in MessWide Framework, some new modules, some new post modules, and lots and lots of improvements. So let's go right into it. Uh, this time around, um, we added a, a few new privilege escalation modules. Those are really hot these days. Uh, Juicy Potato, which is a, a variation of all the, the potato series of vulnerabilities that, that has been out for the last few years, um, just landed in MessWide Framework. It kind of supersedes all of them, but hey, it's cool that, it, it, that someone worked on that and, and got it uh, up into the MessWide Framework. Um, the Blue Man Set DHCP Handler uh, privilege escalation also got pushed into MessWide Framework. And an ASAN uh, set UID executable um, vulnerability went into framework as well. Um, some other things that, that have been improved uh, in Metasploit, uh, the meta shell, which we, which we kind of advertised a bit about Metasploit 5, uh, has been improved a good amount. Um, it now supports things like re resource scripts being run within the meta shell. Um, and and it, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Um, we also have uh, some post modules for doing DNS spoofing, for removing IP tables rules so that you can unblock machines and uh, allow uh, extra sorts of exfiltration and that sort of thing, and being able to uh, enumerate all your session commands. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other improvements that we added in the framework. This is one that I'm pretty excited about, um, and that is uh, the YSU serial um, uh, exploits, or at least uh, I think a few of them actually have been modified to use an automatic YSU serial Java serialization generator. Why is this interesting? It means now that it's actually really easy to implement new Java deserialization um, exploits within Metasploit Framework because you can actually can generate the payloads on the fly as opposed to having to sort of generate hard-coded blobs and stick them into your payload, which is sort of the spirit of Metasploit Framework. Um, being able to dynamically swap your payloads out as, as you need is really kind of what, you know, is, is the meat and potatoes of Metasploit. So it's really cool to see, see that feature for, for YSO serial having been pushed in. Um, one of the really cool things about the way this was implemented was um, we didn't actually have to build a full Metasploit Java compiler into, <laughs> into Metasploit. Instead, what, what the system actually does is it, is it starts with a Docker image, um, loads the real YSO serial tool, and it generates a whole bunch of little binary blobs and figures out all the offsets that need to be patched in to be able to, to update the payloads for different scenarios. Um, and it basically works as a nice little library that you can then incorporate into your modules. So nice bit of code reuse there, and now it's really easy to, to add new um, Java serialization bugs as they get found, which there are still a lot of them out there in the world. Uh, John the Ripper now supports max word length. Um, you can, like I said before, you can automatically run resource scripts on, on new shell sessions as well. So basically when you're doing, say, say mass exploitation using the new R hosts feature inside of Metasploit Framework, you can then do post exploitation as, as a side effect across all your machines. So very good for efficiency and, you know, Kind of showing impact. Um, payload stability fixes. Uh, Metal got a whole bunch of updates and a whole bunch of memory overruns fixed. Um, so actually, it even works on MIPS now. Again, it, did, it, did, <laughs> it, it used to too. Yeah, it was kind of a Mitch Hedberg kind of joke here, but, uh, yeah. but it, it, it still does as well. So happy to see that. Um, also, the MSFDB. Um, so there's a script that starts Metasploit's database. For Metasploit 5, it also now starts uh, a web service that lets you interact with the database over JSON RPC and a whole bunch of other stuff, sets up users and that sort of thing. But something uh, we kind of observed is that it asks you at least a dozen questions on, on initialization, which is probably a little bit more than most users want to have the answer out of the box because they're like, I have no idea. Um, so uh, Erin is going to show us a demonstration of her usability improvements to MSFDB. Okay, um, I believe maybe switch to sharing. Yep. Thank you. Okay. All right, so with the recent release of Metasploit 5 came the Metasploit web service, and uh, as Brent just mentioned, um, one of the pain points of the old MSFDB script, which is what <clears throat> manages, <clears throat> excuse me, the Metasploit database and web service was that it asked you a million questions whenever you did something like reinitialize. You wanted to delete your database data, you wanted to delete your configurations, um, skip through a little bit of it. It asked you what you want your username to be, delete your old SSL key, and it just went on and on and on, and then uh, gave you a bunch of output that wasn't very readable or clear. So in an attempt to make this better, um, this is the new and improved MSFDB script. Um, if I do a reinit, which previously gave you the most options, the first thing is it detects whether or not there will be data uh, potentially deleted, and it asks you whether you would like to delete just once, if you say yes to that, 
Uh, it runs through everything we did before. Uh, you'll notice potentially that there's now some uh, color added to the output for a little bit of a kind of more obvious look at which ones are prompts and which ones are just output. Uh, so that was another improvement. Um, this is the part that takes the longest. Um, eventually, we'll ask you for a username. There it is. I'm going to default to my default username. It now asks you for a password before you couldn't specify a password. So I'm just going to let it generate a random one. And then it will boot up the uh, web service. <clears throat> now, before, one of the problems with the script is it would spit out all of your credentials, your username, password, token, et cetera. And if you didn't know to save them off, you probably wouldn't. And later you would try to go utilize the web service, you wouldn't have your token, and there'd be really no good way to retrieve it. So now we have kind of this very obvious output that tells you, hey, this is your token, you're going to need to save it, and hopefully you're not going to miss something like this. Um, so that's kind of the basic workflow. Um, I'll also show you the um, some of the new options that were added. Uh, one is this use defaults flag that you can put in on the command line, and basically what that does is if you, for instance, you're scripting this, maybe in a cron job for some reason, you don't want to have to interact with the script, you can just say, hey, use all the default options, and it will do that. Uh, you can also now pass in a password um, at runtime as well. And uh, I believe there was one more. Oh, um, there's this new flag called uh, MSF Data Service, which if you specify a name, um, this is the name of your local data service connection in MSF Console, which gets added by default. Or if you say no MSF data service, there will be no data service connection added to console unless you explicitly go add one later. Uh, so that is an overview of all the new enhancements. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, let's see. So who we've got next on the demo docket? Let's see. All right. Oh, it's me. <laughs> so here, let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm gonna I'm gonna demonstrate juicy potato for you guys. Let's see here. And it's super easy to run. Um, let's see. If I can... You know, it doesn't matter how many times I click the share button. I always forget how to do it. Keep sharing. All right, cool. So I'm going to demonstrate this. So I've got a, a handler running. Uh, Juice Potato being a local exploit, of course, requires you to have a session running already. I've already prepared in the, uh, you know, the cooking show type style, a command prompt. I'm going to start my um, test tool, and we'll get a session. This is info, and we're running as we as Brent Cook right now. So let's go ahead and background the session. We're going to search for potatoes, as you do. Um, so now, in addition to the original uh, juicy potato or um, rotten potato exploit, we now have the juicy potato exploit. So let's go ahead and use it. Show options, easy to do. You just basically set your session to session. And by default, it, it basically looks for a particular DCOM class to trigger on. Um, there's particular attributes you can read, uh, some info about the exploit. Oh, well, that didn't demonstrate very well. But there's documentation built to the exploit that um, popped up in an off-screen browser um, that you can read about exactly how to find particular class IDs if, like, say, one gets blacklisted by Microsoft um, or you know, that, that functionality gets removed. You can always find another class ID. It's not that hard to find a whole bunch of them within the Windows ecosystem. Um, but uh, this basically exploits uh, multiple than that. So pretty much so, uh, by default, it's got one that works out of the latest version of Windows 10. So let's go ahead and run it. Uh, let's see. Let me make sure I got everything else set up right. Yeah, should be good. Run. A little bit. Uh, another session should come back here in a second. But basically, it's injecting something completely into the task scheduler. And if not, we'll fix that in post production. <laughs> it takes about a minute to run. The drama. Oh, it didn't run. Let's see. Oh, wrong system, though. Sessions. Let's see if I can put a session. Oh, uh, maybe I forgot to set something off the list. Payload, Windows, Interpreter, Oops. I bet I basically overlooked something silly like 
actually setting your local IP address for your listener or something. In fact, that's exactly what happened. You can see here I accidentally used the wrong IP address mm. by default. Let's try one more time. Can I get some, so, some, some clapping in the audience? <laughs> so while we're waiting, I'm curious, yeah. why were they called the potato exploits? Is there any background on why they were called potato? potatoes? That's a great question. Oh, taters, eh? <laughs> <laughs> no session was created. Ah. Well, it looks like I'm not having super good luck at the moment with this. I got two two runs and no no success here. Uh, let's find out real quick. Let's see if we can uh, switch over to the info here. Um, why was it called the potato exploit? Great question. You know, tell me, I just don't know. I I'm just, I, I'm I just curious. No worries. Does anyone in the audience know about the whole background for potato things? No? I the, uh, the original one was like hot potato. Uh huh. Um, because like you trigger a hash getting sent somewhere, then you redirect it and send it back oh, um, to right. a different oh. service. Kind of like passing I, the hot potato around. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think that's what it was. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. And I guess over time, like the, the meaning got lost completely. Yeah. Because of <laughs> lots of Oh, I got my session. <laughs> just, need, just need to be patient and, and distract people with, with anecdotes. So, <laughs> thank you. So simple is to prove that it's the same machine and get UID. And I'm running as NP authority system, which is who I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. Excellent.